Why is the J unit test logically correct, but the console tester is not? Take a look at this. This one here without any nesting of the try and catch block uh, is a J unit test. But this one here is also without any uh, try and catch uh, nesting. However, it's a console tester, but this is incorrect. Let me first of all, by pointing out, this is logically correct. But this one here is logically incorrect. Let me highlight the points quickly. For this one here, right, is this one here, you can see that if this actually line is reached, reaching this line, well, cause the rest of the test method to be by passed and for the test method to fail. Okay, that's uh, actually correct because as soon as we see the failure from some increment method over here, we should really stop the test. We should not let the caller go any further. On the other hand, as we explained earlier, so let's say here, if this particular error, you can see the error message is really the same, right? You can see for both of them, uh, it's basically here, error value to large exception thrown unexpectedly, and also value to uh, value to large exception was thrown unexpectedly, okay? But in the case of console tester, executing this line will not prevent the rest of the method from being executed. And more precisely, even after this error message was printed out to the console, we will still actually try to execute this block here. It will not be bypassed. And when we try to execute this, you can see this one here is actually inappropriate. Inappropriate because there was already an error. Okay, it's a uh, very important notes for you to uh, for you to actually understand, right? Especially put uh, two side by side, even though they are structurally almost structurally uh, structurally identical, but one is for JUnit test using assertions, the other one is console tester by using system and other print line statements. So it's really important to see the uh, the difference in the execution flows. All right. Now I would like to talk about some exercise together with you. Let's now go back over here. Okay, so this. Kind of relevant, uh, which are uh, almost uh, I almost covered that already in the earlier uh, part. Let's see this. Can we rewrite the test increment from maximum value? Right? Can we just have rather than two try and catch blocks? Can we have a single try and catch block? Do you see any logical flaw to it? Pause the video and think about it. Yes. Why? No. Why not? All right, assuming that you thought about it, hopefully you got some ideas written uh, either uh, put in your mind or maybe uh, sketch on the paper, okay? It turns out this will not be appropriate. You cannot uh, actually just have a single try and catch in this case to really uh, test appropriately, okay? So here, here is my hints to you, okay? Here's the hints. Let's say line number 12 is executed. Over here, line number 12, let's say here. If we actually execute this particular line, what's the, what's the implication? So that means some value to large exception was actually thrown from the associated catch block. Uh, the associated try block. What is the associated try block for this catch block? exactly here. So this is the associated one. And what can be the possible source of throwing this particular uh, value to uh, value to large exce uh, exception? 
it could be this one here. It could be this one here. It could be this one here. From all these three, throwing off value too large exception is unexpected. You'll be premature. On the other hand, it's also possible for the value too large exception to be thrown from here, right? It's a thing. It's a, uh, it's a call to the same method, just at different timings. However, here it has the conflicting uh, expectation. Throwing off the value too large exception is indeed expected. Right? You can see exactly over here uh, unexpected versus expected. So they are conflicting. That's re uh, where the logical error actually comes from. Meaning that if it actually comes from over here, should we fail the test? We should fail the test because it's unexpected. But when it, actually, when it actually comes from over here, about we'll go to the same catch block here, should we fail the test? We shouldn't. So how can we fail and not fail the same test at the same time, right? Okay, again, so let's say if it comes from over here into the catch block, that means the test should fail. Okay, on the other hand, if we actually go from, uh, let me use a different color, if we actually go from here and then go to over here, the test should pass. The problem is there's only a single place for you to specify where whether you should fail or pass. You cannot do it both. So it's not possible for you to actually do it appropriately. So that's why this test over here without uh, without two try and catch blocks are is simply not appropriate. Right? That's the detailed answer. Right? Okay, let's now take a look to see what else we have. Let me go back to the slides and there's only one more example I want to show to you quickly. And that's a simple answer. And then you can also go back to my detailed answer as expected, uh, as explained over here. Let's now go on to the last example I want to show to you. When you, when you are doing your own test cases, you may want to consider uh, using some loops. Loops can actually make it very effective on generating test cases, right? Let me give you one example here. Okay, uh, let me just, uh, so this example I'm gonna show to you, uh, also it's about a counter, but let me just go to the uh, iPad just to annotate it over here. So here we are trying to initialize the counter value to be zero, okay, zero. Uh, let me, alongside, I want to put this uh, line over here to illustrate what the test case is doing. Initially, it's going to be zero. I know that it should be bounded by three, okay? So this one here is going to make sure we actually start with zero over here. And then you can take a look at the first loop. The first loop, I'm going to use green. The first loop, we say four integer i will be counter minimum value, and then go all the way to maximum value minus one. So that means we only go, we go from zero to uh, zero, one, and two in the iteration, right? Zero, one, and also two over here. And then for each one of them, we want to do increments. And then whenever we do increments, we want to make sure C dot get value will be the current value plus one. You can think about the current value is actually re uh, assigned to C dot get value. We're basically comparing before and after to make sure the current value is equal to, well, the current value plus one will be the new result, new result for get value. So for example, if current value is one and we do increments, it should become two. And if the current value is two and we increment by one, it will become three, okay? And no exception should be expected, right? So we can do uh, how many iterations we have in total. So here we got three iterations. Okay, so meaning that, so here for zero, we can do increments. For one, we do increments. For two, we do increments. Okay, we do uh, three already, okay? So that's a green part. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, second loop over here. When we try to do the second loop uh, here, let's say here, second loop, it's going to go from, i will be equal to counter the maximum value, and then you want to i minus minus, right? 
all the way to uh, counter the minimum value plus one. So that means we're gonna go from three to two to one. So go from three from two to one over here, right? And then every time we're simply going to do C dot decrements over here. And whenever you do C dot decrements, do you expect any value, uh, any uh, value to small exception to be thrown? In this case, no, because when you go from three and say decrements, it's gonna go decrement to two. Again, we're gonna get C dot get value and also C dot get value. So this one here should be exactly equal to this value minus one when you do decrements as opposed to plus one over here. Okay, we do decrement when it's two, when we do decrement in the last iteration when it's one, right? So, so far you can see only two loops. We actually cover already actually uh, six different test cases. Of course, here we're talking about a very uh, small bounded uh, variable between zero and three. Imagine that if you got a counter maybe with a, a boundary between zero and that 1000, you can easily use another, uh, just the same two loops just by uh, changing the bounds for the loop counter to cover that, right? But in the, in the case of, uh, of the console tester, uh, you may just have to uh, print out so many lines to the console and examine them uh, manually, which is not ideal. Okay, uh, and of course, in this particular case, we never try to increments or decrements when the value is either too uh, large or too small. So that's why you will see that over here, the uh, catch value to large exception or catch value to small exception reaching either one. Okay, reach either one of them we actually fail the test. So what we are saying is, when we actually do all these over here, this part over here. Okay, so for this part here, no exception. Either value to small exception or value to large exception is expected. So that is why if the execution flow is actually broken inside the iteration in any one of the loops to either here or to here, in that case, you're gonna fail the test, right? So it's only uh, one example to show to you how you can use the loops to actually do more test cases in a single one, okay? You can definitely take this uh, some inspiration for you so you can try to experiment that yourself when you develop your own test cases, all right? So that's about it. And the final topic I want to speak about for test-driven developments is to talk about its uh, flowchart.